So let's suppose I have this block, it has mass m, and there's a string attached to this block, and the string comes up, and the string is wrapped around uh, the cylinder here. I'm going to call this thing a spool, or I might even call it a pulley. It kind of looks like both. But nonetheless, this the string is wrapped around. The pulley has a radius r. And what else am I giving you? I'm giving you the mass of the block. I already said the mass of the pulley. I'll call it mp. Uh, the moment of inertia of this spool about the center. I'll call it ig. I'm giving you the initial height of this thing. We're going to assume this thing's released from rest. And I already told you the radius of that thing. So what I want to do is I want to find tg. And I'm going to let tg here denote the time it takes for the block to hit the ground. Now, as usual, I'm going to start with some free body diagrams. I'll start with the block itself. It has a force upward due to the tension in this rope or the string. There's also a force pulling down equal to the weight of the block. And of course, I also need a mass acceleration diagram. So let me draw this in here. And again, even though I know this thing's going to accelerate down, when acceleration is an unknown, I always draw it in the positive direction. Let me also try to squeeze in the free body diagram of the spool or the pulley itself as well. It has a force down because of the weight of the pulley. I call that mpg in the minus j hat direction. Also, there's a force upward acting through the pin, right? This pin is being supported by this bracket here. And then I have one more force. That is the, the tension pulling down on the pulley. And look, there we go. So now I have the tension pulling down right here, right? And that's this, this cable or this rope here pulling down right at the point where the rope comes in contact with the pulley. So I'll call this tension T. That's the same tension right there the rope, but this time in the minus j direction. And then finally, I need a mass acceleration diagram for the pulley as well. Notice that the center of mass, that is this pin here, is not moving left or right. It's not moving up or down. So therefore, the center of mass has no acceleration by itself. But that pulley is rotating, right? So it has an angular acceleration. I would put an angular acceleration onto this mass acceleration diagram. And again, even though I know this spool is going to have an acceleration which is clockwise, I'm going to draw it counterclockwise just to keep things positive, right? A positive angular acceleration would be in the positive k hat direction. I cross j is k coming out of the board. So positive is actually counterclockwise here. So I'm going to stick with that, even though I expect alpha to be negative. So again, ig here is my moment of inertia of the spool about the center mass. All right, so let's scroll up and start deriving equations of motion. We'll start with Newton's second law, and we'll do this for the block. Of course, Newton's second law is just F equals MA. And for the block, all the motion's in the J hat direction. All the motion's vertical. So let's just write this out for the J hat direction. I've got tension up, I've got weight down, and this has to equal mass times acceleration. Again, I'm just reading this directly off of my free body diagram and mass acceleration diagram. Now for the pulley, remember just a moment ago, we said that the center of mass does not move, right? It's, it's motionless. So I'm not going to have a left, right, up, and down equation of motion for the pulley, but I am going to have a rotational equation. And these particular relationships come from Euler. And in particular, what we're doing is we're summing up all our external moments. And these are moments about the center of mass in this case. This has to equal the moment of inertia about the center of mass times the angular acceleration of the body. Now, in this case, I've defined I and J as such. So therefore, my moment my angular acceleration, all these are going to be in the k-hat direction. The convention is k-hat's going to be counterclockwise moment. And what's producing a moment? Well, the weight and the pin force, they act right through the center of the body, right through the center of mass. So, so these two forces do not produce a moment. But that tension does produce a moment. And that tension produces a moment about the center, which is clockwise, which is exactly the opposite direction I'm calling positive. So this is a negative moment equal to the tension times the radius of the pulley. And this has to equal moment of inertia about the center of mass times the angular acceleration of that spool pulley thing. All right, so let's get to work on this. I'm going to call the first equation equation number one and the second one equation number two. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first equation here, solve that thing for tension, the T, and then substitute it into right here because thus I'm going to eliminate the tension Tension, right? I didn't care about the tension. I had nowhere asked for the tensions. So let's do that. So I've got the second equation, which is minus r, like that, times the tension, which is mg plus ma. And this has to equal ig alpha. Or I can write this as, look, I can bring all the accelerations to the right-hand side. So I get minus r mg on the left side equals ig alpha plus m times r times a. Call this thing equation number three. After working through this math, for a while, it's good to sort of remember where we are and where we're going. 
Remember the idea, the hope, the goal is to find the time it takes for this block to accelerate downward. So it'd be good to have the acceleration of that block, right? And that's exactly what we're after right here. The A here is the acceleration of the block. And we've got it in terms of R. We know R, we know M, we know G, we know IG. Ooh, but we don't know alpha, right? So we need to, we need to write this in terms of alpha. So I've got one equation left that came from equation number one and number two over here. And it really, I have two unknowns in here. I don't know what the acceleration is. That's what I want to find, but I also don't know this angular acceleration alpha. Now what I want to do is bring back into your memory um, some experiences we had with the standard pulley problems. Do you remember what we did with the pulley problem? What we did is we wrote out equations of motion for one of these masses and wrote equations of motion for the other mass. We were able to take these two equations of motion, we were able to combine them and eliminate the tension and this and then we found out we had one equation left with two unknowns, the acceleration of each block. What we had to do is find a kinematic relationship between the accelerations of these two blocks and we said well if block one if the block on the right goes up one foot then the block on the left has to go down one foot so if it goes up one foot per second squared on the right then it must go down one foot per second squared on the left so there was a relationship between the accelerations of these two blocks and when we had more complicated pulley systems like this one over here we had more complicated relationships kinematic relationships between the acceleration of the two blocks but nonetheless it was a kinematic relationship it's just some little algebraic relationship that said uh because because the length of this rope has to remain constant, the length of the rope doesn't change, I can, I can derive, I can come up with an expression that between the acceleration of the block on the left to the acceleration of the block on the right. Now what we're going to do in this problem, with the, the thing I'm calling this pulley spool thing, I'm going to come up with a kinematic relationship between the acceleration of this block over here and the angular acceleration of the spool, right? I want a kinematic relationship between A over here and the alpha. And you'll find it's not as complicated as these earlier pulley problems. It's actually quite simple. All right, so what I'm going to do is look at this point right there. This is the point where the rope first comes in contact with the spool. And I'm going to call that point Q. And of course, I'll call the center here. We've already called that G, so I'll keep on calling that one G. But again, this is a point where I have rope in contact with the spool. Now what I'm going to do is write an expression for the acceleration of this point Q. But it's acceleration for a point on the rope at point Q, in parentheses. So acceleration of the rope at point Q, I'm gonna call that AQ. Now remember, this is my usual pulley assumption that the rope does not stretch. So the acceleration of this point of the rope right here at point Q is the same as the acceleration of the rope right here. And the same as the acceleration of the rope down there, right? That all moves as one rigid body. And in particular, it's the same as the acceleration of the block. So the acceleration of the block, something I already called A, and it's an acceleration in the J hat direction of A. And similarly, I'm gonna write the acceleration of point Q but rather than the rope, I'm going to consider the point on the spool that's at, at point Q. So acceleration at point Q of the spool, what is that? Well, that's another rigid body here. I've got a spool. This is a wheel that acts as one rigid body. And I can write this as the acceleration of the center of mass plus the acceleration of point Q relative to the center of mass. And for a rigid body, this is an alpha cross a position Q relative to G plus an omega cross an omega cross position of Q relative to G again. Now, as we've said already a few times, the acceleration of that center mass is zero, right? That pin is not moving. And if you work out this cross product here, you'll find that this term is just alpha times R. Alpha is the magnitude of my angular acceleration. R is this radius here. And that's in the positive J hat direction. And then I get a, a centripetal piece too, which is an R, which is an omega squared times R, omega is the angular, magnitude of the angular velocity, and that's centripetal, right, towards the center, so this would be in the minus i hat direction. Now the next part of this argument is important, so engage your mind here, make sure you understand this. What I'm going to argue is that this string is wrapped around the spool, right? And the string is wrapped around perhaps many times, and the string is not sliding on that spool. I keep on saying string, I said rope earlier, same thing. The rope is not sliding on that spool. It's kind of like a wheel rolling without slipping on, on a dry pavement. And because of that, there's a relationship, there's an equality, there's an equivalence between the acceleration of the rope and the acceleration of the spool. It's not a complete equivalence. In fact, you can see it in these two expressions. They can't be exactly the same. In fact, this one has an acceleration in the i hat direction, or negative i hat direction, whereas this one certainly doesn't. And I hope that makes sense because 
Remember this acceleration in the minus i hat direction, that's centripetal. That's because this point Q on the pulley is going around in circles, so it has an acceleration inward. Whereas the rope, the rope is moving in a straight line as soon as it, it leaves the spool. So it does not have a centripetal acceleration. Nonetheless, it's the j hat components, it's the direction tangent to the spool for which these accelerations must be the same. So this component of acceleration in the j hat direction of the rope has to equal this this component of acceleration, the j hat direction of the spool in order for them not to slide. So therefore this no slip condition tells us that in the j hat direction that component of acceleration has to equal alpha times r. And what do we have? We have now have a kinematic relationship between the acceleration of the block and the angular acceleration of the spool. That's exactly what we needed up here in order to turn equation number three into a single equation which I can just solve for the acceleration. A. So what I'm going to do is call this equation number four down here and we'll take our equation number four and we're going to substitute it into equation number three and remember it's the A we want, right? We want the acceleration and in doing so we find A equals minus G divided by one plus and I got moment of inertia divided by MR squared. So this is how I wrote mine. Uh, when you do this, when you do this manipulation you can end up with an expression that looks a little bit different but it will be completely equivalent. You might have an MR in the numerator. In that case you'd also have an extra MR in the denominator or something like that. But in the end I hope you can verify that this is equivalent to what you get. Now I kind of like this expression for acceleration because for two reasons I guess. One is it's nice and clean but another one is that it's it's nice to interpret this one I think. Let's, let's do a little thought experiment. Remember earlier in the semester we said pulleys have no mass, right? So what if the pulley had no mass? Then and it would have no moment of inertia right here. So if it had no moment of inertia, no ig, then my acceleration would be just minus g divided by one here. The acceleration would be minus g. Is the 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 block would have an acceleration as if there was nothing pulling up on it. It would just sort of fall under the, the effect of gravity all by itself. But what's happening is if my pulley has mass, it has rotational inertia. That's what that IG is. So when gravity's pulling down this block here, you know, pulling this chunk of mass down, it's also spinning up the spool. The spool has mass, the spool has inertia, it doesn't want to accelerate, so it's gonna take some tugging to get it going down. So what we see is with this moment of inertia here, what it does is it slows down the acceleration of the block. It's gonna make it less than the acceleration due to gravity, G right here. That's the IG. Now where were we in this problem again? I've got an acceleration here, but that's not what I wanted, right? Let's go back up to the top. What I wanted was a time for this block to hit the ground. Woo, okay. Let's do it. So we, and really the, the next, the rest of the problem is should be trivial. It's stuff we've been doing all semester long. You should be, almost be a pro at this by now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the velocity of the block be V or scalar V in the J hat direction. Position be Y in the J hat direction. And just as it has all semester long, my, my speed, my velocity can be written as the integral of acceleration against the time integral. And this Acceleration is all this stuff right here, but I don't feel like writing this over and over again, so I'll just write A. But the important point to note is that A is just a constant here. So therefore, when I integrate A with respect to time, it's just A times time plus a constant of integration I'm calling C1. To find this constant C1, what we do is we employ the, the initial condition. And I've already done this a thousand times. I assume you have too, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. The initial condition says, the speed at time zero. Since I started at rest, this has to be zero, which is going to tell me that C2 has to be zero, which tells me that this speed as a function of time is just A times T. I got rid of that constant of integration. And then the, the height or the position of the block as a function of time, this is gonna be the integral of the speed or the velocity here. So this is just the integral of A times T with respect to time, which is one half A T squared. Again, I get another constant of integration. I'll call it C2. And again, to find that constant of integration, I apply the initial condition that, that y at time zero, that's gonna be that the height h, which is going to tell me if you work it out that c2 is h, which again now tells me that y is a function of time, is equal to, what is this, one half at squared plus h. Woo, I'm going through this quickly because I assume you've seen this. And next what I'm going to do is let 
TG be the time at which this block hits the ground. So therefore, Y evaluated at TG, just substitute it in. That's when it hits the ground, right? So that is going to be at Y equals zero. This tells me that TG is two times, oh, minus two times H divided by the acceleration all square root. And then finally, I'll do this in the last step. I'll substitute the expression for acceleration that I had previously. And this gives me that TG equals all this stuff right here. How's that look? I'll let you go up and find that acceleration. Substitute it in. Verify this for yourself. Notice that minus sign disappeared because the acceleration had a minus sign in it quite nicely. Actually, let me put a box around this thing as I require all of you to do. Again, if you're taking my class, I ask you to check the units of this thing. So let's do that really quickly. I got two times h. h is a length. That's the height, right? g is an acceleration. That's a length over time squared. And then all this stuff in, the, in these parentheses, I got a 1, which is a nothing. I got ig. What is ig? IG is a mass times a length squared. Look it up. And then in the denominator there, I also have a mass times a length squared. Ooh, that's kind of convenient. Mass length squared over mass length squared, which cancel each other ex out exactly, which has to be true because I'm adding it to a unitless thing right there. So what I have inside here is unitless, and I'm taking the square root of that whole thing. So I got a length divided by length, and then I got a time squared in the denominator of the denominator. So this is a time squared. Of uh, square root which is a time so this checks out that's exactly what I want I want a time also let's make sure it makes sense think about what this mo moment of inertia is doing remember that's the rotational inertia of the disk the more rotational the inertia of the disk the bigger this this quantity is I'm taking the square root of but nonetheless take the square root of something big you get something big still so the bigger this IG is the longer it's going to take to hit the ground kind of makes sense I hope all right we're done.